Mark Volkman. I work at a company called Object Computing in the St. Louis area. We provide all kinds of software consulting, and I've been very focused on web development for the past 10 years or so and worked in many different frameworks. And uh, my latest interest is in Svelte, and I wrote the book Svelte and Sapper in Action for Manning recently that came out uh, last fall. And so I want to tell you all the things that I love about Svelte. You'll notice in the middle there, it has a, a GitHub URL where I have slides for all of my talks. So if you go to that, that uh, URL, there's a Svelte directory and you'll find these slides there. Uh, so Svelte is an alternative to other web frameworks you might be familiar with, like React and Vue and Angular. But one thing that makes it really different is that it's a compiler, not a runtime library. And what that means is that it, uh, you write your components in files with a .svelte extension, and they get compiled into JavaScript. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of benefits to that that I'll be talking about in just a bit. But Svelte doesn't have any dependencies. It only has dev dependencies, some kind of developer tooling. That's because everything you need in your app gets compiled into JavaScript. Going along with that, it doesn't use a virtual DOM. So other frameworks like React and Vue use a virtual DOM. And that can be really inefficient. And it just isn't necessary if you use this compiler approach. So Rich Harris, who created Svelte, did a talk called uh, Rethinking Reactivity, where he goes into quite a bit of detail on why the virtual DOM is uh, unnecessarily expensive in terms of code size and the time to do diffing of, of the virtual DOM. So I recommend checking uh, out that talk. So Rich Harris, he used to work at The Guardian. Now he works at The New York Times. And he's got quite a lot of experience in creating open source libraries. He created the Ractiv framework, which as far as I know is still in use at The Guardian. He also created the Rollup module bundler. So he's got a lot of experience in the open source world. So uh, Svelte Kit is a framework that builds on top of Svelte. And there was an earlier framework called Sapper that I talk about in my book. Svelte Kit replaces that. Most of the concepts are the same. Names of some things have been changed. The implementation has been improved. And Svelte Kit is in beta right now. Uh, but I do want to tell you about some of the things coming there. So when you create an application in Svelte, you don't get a setup of page routing out of the box to make it so when the users go to different URLs, they go to different pages in your app. And there are many ways that you can set that up. And my book talks about uh, a lot of those. But Svelte Kit makes that much easier by giving you file-based page routing. And what that means is that you just drop your Svelte components into a certain directory, the ones that you want to treat as pages of your app, and they are automatically treated as routes so that if you add slash in the name of that component to your URL, it navigates to that component. Similarly, it's really easy to implement REST services in Svelte Kit. You just put a JavaScript file in a certain directory, it picks up the name of that file or the name of the subdirectory as the route to that REST service, and then you just write functions like get and put and post and delete, and that turns into your REST services. Now, you don't have to take advantage of that. If you want to implement REST services using some other tech stack, maybe you want to write them in Go or Java or C Sharp, you can still do that. But if you're open to implementing the REST services with Node.js, it can be part of this one Svelte Kit app. Svelte Kit gives you layouts, and that means that you can specify that uh, all the pages in my app have a common header, footer, maybe a left nav, but then that main area is where I want to display the content of each page. If something goes wrong in the app, there's a common error page that can be displayed for users. Uh, Svelte Kit gives you code splitting for JavaScript and CSS, and what that means is that with most frameworks, you're bundling the whole thing into uh, one ball of JavaScript that has to get downloaded before the app begins. But with this code splitting, it can make it so that when you hit the first page of your app, you're only downloading the JavaScript and CSS needed for that one page. And then when you visit the next page, it'll download what is needed for that one. And so the whole experience is faster for users because they're only pulling down the parts that they actually need. Spellkit provides hot module reloading, which is great for iterative development. It makes it so that when you save a change to a component, 
all it needs to do is compile that component and reload its JavaScript. It doesn't have to take the time to rebundle the whole application and download it to the browser again. Uh, it also provides static pages and sites. So you could say, this whole site is static, so at build time, generate HTML for the whole thing, or only certain pages are static and generate HTML for those. Uh, then StealthKit sets up a lot of tooling for you, and I, I won't spend much time talking about this, but it's basically uh, letting you use TypeScript if you want to, using a CSS processor if you'd like to, setting up ESLint for checking for issues in your code and setting up Prettier for formatting your code. And then the last thing I wanna mention is the use of adapters. So SvelteKit bills itself as a serverless first platform. And what they mean by that is they wanna make it really easy for you to deploy the backend functionality of your app as serverless functions. And so this ties into those file-based endpoints that I talked about earlier, where I'm just writing simple functions like get and post and then if I say I want to use a adapter like Netlify or Vercel, then when I deploy my app, it's going to deploy those functions as serverless functions for me without me having to understand all the details of that. So if I want to get started with SvelteKit, I can create a new project by running npm init svelte at next and then give it the name of my project. It's going to ask me some questions like, do I want to use TypeScript? Do I want to use a CSS preprocessor? Do I want ESLint and Prettier? Uh, and then it'll set up everything for me. All of those boxes on the right are just my recommendations for how I like to configure those tools, but that's totally up to you how you'd like to do that. Then you just CD into the directory of your project and run an NPM install, and now you're ready to run the app. So to run it, you can enter npm run dev and you're running in development mode where it gives you watch and live reload. So it's watching to see if you make changes to any of the files like the components. And then if you do, it'll compile those and then live reload those changes into the browser. If you want, you can tell that command to open the app in your default web browser so that you don't have to go to the browser yourself and type in localhost 3000. Uh, you can also tell it to run on a different port. Uh, then once the app is running correctly and you want to deploy it, you can do an npm build and it will populate the build directory with the files that you need to deploy. And if you want to check for issues in the code, npm run lint. And if you want to format the code, npm run format. Uh, so with all that background behind us, let's walk through a sample app. And I want to go through the to-do app. I know it's kind of a, a old thing that we're used to seeing, but I think it's useful because you already know what the functionality is and you can compare it to an implementation that you've seen with other frameworks. So you can find this code at the GitHub repo there. I have two repos listed. The second one is a work in progress where I'm taking this to an extreme and tying into a database and adding user authentication and all those kind of things. So for now, we're just focusing on the first part of this. And I'm gonna jump out to my web browser and demonstrate this really quickly. So here's what we're trying to build. And I can type in a to-do item like get milk, and it adds that for me. And I can select that to say that that task is done. And then if I want to clear out all the ones that are done, I can click this archive completed button and those are going to go away. Okay. And uh, I could just delete a task and notice the animation that's happening here. It's kind of subtle, but well, when I add a new item, you could see it kind of fades into view. And the same thing happens if I delete one, it's going to fade out of view. Okay, a little bit subtle, but we'll see that in the code coming up here. Okay, uh, so this app is really made up of two components. There's the part outlined in red, which I call the to-do component. The to-do component is a list item, and it has three things inside it, a checkbox, the text of the item, and then a button for deleting it. And an interesting thing about the to-do component is that it doesn't know about the whole list of to-dos, and so if I say I want to delete it, it doesn't really know how to do that. However, its parent component does. The same thing if I toggle its done state by clicking the checkbox. And so it's going to dispatch events up to its parent component and let it take care of those kinds of changes. The part where it says one of two remaining, uh, that I refer to as the status. And you'll see how that gets updated here. 
So we'll start with the to-do component. And here's the whole thing on one slide demonstrating a bunch of Svelte uh, features. So the first thing we'll notice here is that the Svelte component has three sections to it. All of these sections are optional, but many components have all three. So at the top, I've got all of my JavaScript code. And in the middle, I have all the HTML that I want to render. And at the bottom, I have all of the CSS for styling this. So starting at the top, remember I said that this component doesn't really know how to delete it, the to-do or how to toggle its state. Instead, what I want to do is dispatch an event. And so you see those red dispatch calls there. And in order to use that feature of Svelte, I have to import create event dispatcher. And then I call that on line four, which gives me a dispatch function. And then that's what I'm calling on lines 12 and 15. That uh, animation that I mentioned, that's done with a fade transition. So I'm importing that on line three, and then I apply it on line eight. And so on line eight, what I'm saying is that when that list item enters the DOM, it should fade into view. And if it leaves the DOM, it should fade out of view. And that's all I have to do to get that special effect. Line five is where I'm declaring a prop. This is how data comes into components, or it's, it's one way that that can happen. So the use of the export keyword there uh, is what makes that a prop. Okay, and then skipping down to the HTML, inside the list item, as I said, there are three things. There's the checkbox, there's the text of the to-do, and then there's the delete button. So that prop coming in on line five is actually an object that has uh, two, well, three properties. It has a unique ID, it has the text of the to-do, and then it has a done Boolean to tell me whether it's already been completed. And so that input on line nine, you see on line 11, I'm saying the input should already be checked if to do dot done is true. Uh, and then I have some event handling set up. If you change the state of the checkbox, I'm going to dispatch a toggle done event. And we'll see uh, in a bit how the parent component reacts to that. Then we have the text of the to do. And you see in the middle of that span, there's curly braces with to do dot text. So that's called an interpolation. And that's going to display the text of my to-do. But the other thing I want to do is add a CSS class to this span. And I want it to either be done-true or done-false. And you see down in the style section on line 19, I'm telling it that if this task is done, I want the color to be gray and I want to draw a line through the text. So that's the purpose of that CSS class. Uh, and then we have the delete button. And if you click that, I'm going to dispatch a delete event and the parent component is gonna take care of that for me. Uh, then the styling we've already kind of talked about, there's a little bit of a margin above each list item to separate them. And then another interesting point about this is that when you look at this code, nowhere in here do you see the name of the component that I'm defining. The file name is todo.svelte. But actually the way this works is when another component wants to use this one and it imports it, it can decide at that point what it wants to call the component. And so we'll see that on the next slide when this gets imported. All right, so here is my topmost component that represents the entire app. And you see the first thing happening in the script tag is that it imports the to-do component. Everything on this slide is the JavaScript, and then we'll see the HTML on the next slide, and then the CSS after that. So my to-do items have a unique ID. And so line four is where I'm setting last ID so I can keep track of which, what was the ID I used last. And then on line five, I've got a function for creating a brand new to-do object. It's written as an arrow function, and I can pass it the text of the to-do, and then optionally tell it if this is already done. Usually when you create a to-do, it's not done yet. Uh, but if you want, you can pass true for that. And then all I'm doing is returning an object that has those three properties. So the ID property gets set to the very next last ID value. So there's two things happening there. It's incrementing last ID. And then I use it as the ID of this uh, to-do I'm creating. And then I use the text and I use the done Boolean. On line seven, I have the variable that's going to hold the text that the user types in for creating a brand new to do. And then lines eight through 11, I'm creating an array of to do's that I want to exist uh, right away, just for demo purposes, so that it doesn't start out empty. 
And so I'll create a to-do for learning Svelte, and I say, that's already done, and then create to-do, build a Svelte app, that isn't done yet. So an interesting thing about Svelte is that top-level variables in a script tag like this, they are the state of my component. And what I mean by saying that they're the state is if some of my JavaScript code changes those values and I use them in my HTML, it's going to know to update. All I have to do is change those values. So when you compare this to something like, say, React, where you might use the use state hook, I don't have to set up anything like that here. I just create a variable. Lines 13 and 14 are reactive declarations. This is another key feature of Svelte that is a bit like working with spreadsheets. So you're probably used to spreadsheets where you put a formula inside a cell that refers to other cells. And you know that if you change the values in those other cells, that formula is going to trigger and recompute the value for the cell that it is in. That's kind of what's happening with line 13 and 14. So just looking at 13, that is saying if the value of to do's, which is an array, ever changes, we need to run that line again. And so the purpose of this line is to look through all the to do's in the array, find all the ones that are not done, and then give me the length of that resulting array. And that's my uncompleted count. Uh, so when is that going to get triggered? Well, if I check a checkbox in front of a to-do or I uncheck it, either way, I'm going to be changing the to-do's array, and it's going to trigger that line 13 to run again, and I'll get a new value for uncompleted count. Line 14 is looking at two things, to-do's and also the uncompleted count. So if either of those change, I'm going to compute a new string value for status. So that feature, Reactive Declarations, saves a lot of lines of code because it's an easy way for you to say, hey, the value of this variable really de depends on the values of some others. And so I'm just going to tell you what the relationship is, and then you make sure you recompute it when it's necessary. Uh, then we get into some of the functions that are needed here. If I want to add a brand new to-do, well, I'm counting on the value of to do text getting updated when the user types into that input. And so that should already have a good value. I just need to call create to do, pass it that text, and then I'm going to concatenate that to do onto my array and assign it back to to do's. And that's kind of an important point here. Uh, Svelte won't know that you've updated an array unless you assign a value to that same variable. And I'll touch on that again a bit later. Also, after I've created a brand new to-do, I want to clear out the, the input so you're ready to type in another one. And that's why on line 18, I set to-do text to an empty string. If you click the archive button, I'll call archive completed. And in a real implementation, I would be saving these in a database somewhere. But in this simple version, I'm really just deleting all of the ones that are uh, done, keeping the ones that are not done. Line 23, I'm deleting a specific to-do. I'll be past its ID, and I just need to filter my array of to-dos and say, only keep the ones that are not the one I want to delete. And then the toggle done function, uh, that is going to loop through all of the to-dos and say, if this is the one with the ID that I want to toggle, then in the curly braces here, the dot, 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 T says, keep all the same properties that were in that to-do, but I want to change the value of done to be not what it was before. But if it's not the one I'm looking to toggle, then just keep the whole to-do object. So that's a real compact way of writing that. So one thing you'll notice about this code is that there's no use of the this keyword anywhere. All of this is just plain JavaScript functions, which makes it really easy to write and really easy to understand. So this is the JavaScript portion of our topmost component. And now we're ready to look at the HTML. And if you can imagine back to that UI that we saw before, you'll see all of those pieces here. So we've got an H2 tag with to-do list as the header. Uh, then we had that line where I was displaying the status that would say like one of two completed. So that's in the variable status. All I have to do is print that string. And remember from the previous screen that we're going to recompute that status anytime the uncompleted count changes or the to-do's array changes. 
So if that changes, this bit is going to get re-rendered and show me the new status. Uh, then I've got my button for archiving the completed ones. If you click it, I call archive completed, which we saw in the previous slide. Then I've got a form where you can enter a new to do. So I've got a text input and then I've got a button that you can click for adding it. But notice that this is inside a form, which makes it so that if I'm in the input and I type something and I just hit the enter key, that's also going to trigger a submit. And so up here on the form, I'm saying, if there's a submit event, first, I don't want you to do the default thing. So prevent the default. But what I really want to do is call my add to do function, which we saw on the previous slide. Uh, notice that the input has this bind colon value. And so that means whatever the value of to do text is now, that's what will be displayed in the input. And if the user changes the input, that's going to update the variable. So they're tied together with that bind. The button needs to be disabled if the user hasn't typed in any text yet. And so this is a simple way to do that. It's disabled if not to do text. Uh, then at the bottom, I need to loop through all the to do's in my array. So I use pound sign each. So this is a mustache style syntax for the markup. And so for each of the to do's in the array, I want to render a to do component. And I'm passing the to do into that component as a prop. In other frameworks, what you would see on line 20 is to do equals curly brace to do curly brace. But in Svelte, there's a shortcut that says, if the name of the variable is the same as the name of the prop, you don't need to tell me the name of the prop. You just put it in curly braces. Uh, then remember the to-do component dispatched some events. And this is how I can listen for them. This says, if the to-do component dispatches a delete event, then this is what I want to do. I want to call delete to-do and give it the ID of the one to delete. And if it dispatches a toggle done event, I want to call toggle done and pass it the whole to do object. So very simple for components to communicate back to the parent and by dispatching events. Those events can even contain custom data uh, if you need to do that. The only thing left is the CSS and there's really not a lot fancy going on here. It's mostly just focused on lines 11 through 15 where I'm making my unordered list not have bullets in front of the list items. Okay, so that's the whole thing. A lot of uh, features of, of Svelte that we've seen there. Now, in the interest of time, there's some things that I need to skip over, and this is one of those slides that you might wanna check out later, but this is just comparing how you implement logic in the markup of different frameworks. Uh, but this is a concise list of what I view as the top features of Svelte. And so the first thing is that it's very fast. And so if you go to that URL, you can see some benchmarks comparing different frameworks and see just how Svelte is compared uh, to the others. Uh, another feature is really small bundle sizes. So when you compile a Svelte app to a single JavaScript file, that file is really small compared to the bundles that you get from the other frameworks. And the benefit of that is that it loads much faster in the browser. Svelte has file-based component definitions. And what I mean by that is that what defines a component is a .svelte file with those three sections in it. And I'll talk more about uh, the benefits of that uh, in a couple more slides. CSS is scoped by default. And that means, for example, in that to-do component, if I said, hey, I want the button to have a red background, that doesn't mean that all the buttons in the application should be red. It's just scoped to that one component. Uh, but if there's a, a global CSS that I want to define, I still can do that. And Svelte gives me a clear place to put that global CSS. Svelte has really easy component state management. And what I mean by that is the fact that uh, whatever variables I have that are top level in a component, that is my state. And if I want to change it, I just set the variable. There's nothing special I need to do. And Svelte is watching for those variable changes and will update the appropriate parts of the DOM for me. Reactive statements. We saw the use of dollar colon, and I mentioned how this is kind of like working in a spreadsheet. I think that that really cuts down on your code quite a bit, makes the components very simple.
Uh, the two-way data binding, we saw an example of that in the input where I used bind colon value for an input so I could tie the value of a variable to what the user might type into that uh, input. Uh, Built-in animations, we saw an example of the fade animation, but there are many more built into Svelte. And so that really encourages adding animation to your app because it's so easy to do. And then the last feature that we haven't actually seen yet is state management across components using stores. We need some way that we can store data outside any single component, but make it so that multiple components can access that data. And if any one of them changes the data, the others need to react to that and update based on the change. So I'll, I'll talk in a bit more detail about that just a little bit here. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, Svelte gives you really small bundle sizes, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there's a, a URL that you can go to there, and you can see in the blue boxes pretty drastic difference between the gzip size of a web app across these different frameworks, and then the number of lines you'd have to write. And this is all implementing the same web application. I mentioned that Svelte gives you file-based components, and that just means that there's no kind of JavaScript container that defines a component. It's not like Angular, where you have to write a TypeScript class, or React, where you define a component in a function or a class, or Vue, where you define an object literal with certain properties. With Svelte, it's just a .svelte file that has those three sections in it, and I really like that approach. I mentioned that the CSS is scoped by default and there's a clear place to put your global CSS. And so this slide summarizes that bit for you. But I really want to uh, focus on the next couple of slides. And so this one is just hammering away on component state management. And here I'm focused on just managing state within a single component. And this is a really simple example where all I want to do is have a counter component. And so I have a piece of state in a variable called count, and I have an increment function. And you see down below that my, in my HTML, I'm rendering the count and I have a button. And if you click it, I'm gonna call increment. All that does is bump up the count. It's just modifying the variable and Svelte is gonna notice that and re-render the content of that div below. The only caveat to this is that when you're updating something like an array, if all you do is concatenate, or if you push a value onto an array, Svelte won't notice that you've modified it because it thinks, well, that array is still pointing to the same address. So there are a few ways that you can address this. As long as you're assigning back to it, Svelte is gonna notice that and uh, know that it needs to update anything that was using that data. But there's a trick at the very bottom that I like to use because if I've got a large array and I make a copy of it, that could be expensive. Uh, so using the trick at the bottom, I can push something onto the array and just assign it to itself. And when you look at that last line, you're thinking, well, that doesn't do anything. But actually, the Svelte compiler sees that, and that's a clue to Svelte that you actually want it to consider that to be a change. And so that's kind of an optimization that I take advantage of a lot. We've been talking about these reactive statements, and I've said that if anything that you use in that expression changes, it's going to rerun that line. And you can take advantage of that for debugging, like in that console log. So that's saying if the value of count changes, write it out to the DevTools console again. So that's a, a neat way to do some debugging. You can apply that dollar colon to a block of code as well to say, I want to re-execute all the lines of code in that block if anything they use changes. And you can also put it in front of an if statement. Here's a really interesting example where I'm calculating a, a home loan. And so I have some starting values for an interest rate, a loan amount in a number of years, and then a bunch of reactive statements that calculate what I need ending up in a payment. So notice that if the number of years changes, I need to recompute the months. And if the months change, that's going to trigger this denominator to recompute. And if the denominator changes, that's going to cause the payment to recompute. So once you've got that all set up, this is really the entire app. You see all of these inputs that have a bind to a variable. So if I change the value in the input, it's going to change that. And because loan amount is used up here in the payment, it'll recalculate the payment. 
So uh, let me jump out of here and go over to my browser and demonstrate this. So this is running in something called the Svelte REPL, where you can type in code and test it out without even having to download anything. And so this is that same example. And look at how if I increase the interest rate, my monthly payment goes up. And if I increase the number of years, my monthly payment goes down. Or if I just change the loan amount, it automatically recomputes. And this is the entire app all based on the fact that I'm binding to variables with my inputs and I have these reactive statements that know to recompute if anything the use changes. So I think this is a really compelling example to show some of the benefits of Svelte. Okay, uh, so stores is the last big topic I want to touch on. And so this is a way that you can communicate between components and have data that's stored outside any components. Often I put this in a file called stores.js and uh, there are four kinds of stores you can create. They can be writable, they could be read only. Derived means that they get data from other stores and combine it in some way. And then custom, uh, you're just really controlling the API for how you uh, get the data into that store. So if I want to create one of these writable stores, it's as easy as importing the writable function, and then I call it and I pass to it the starting value of that store. So maybe this is going to be a collection of descriptions of dogs, and I start off with no dogs in the collection. I could also do it in a more fancy way where I pass it a function that could do something like call a REST service that is pulling data from a database, and then when it returns it to me, I call the set function, and that's how my store got its initial data. And then if I want, I can return a function that will be called when I'm no longer using this store to clean up. Okay, and so this slide talks about how you can use a store inside one of your components. There's a long way and there's a short way, and you probably never want to do it the long way. So that's the top box here. The easy way is that you just import your store. So if I Flip back to this slide, you see that my stores.js is exporting this variable called dog store. And right here, I'm importing that from stores.js. And now inside my component, as long as I refer to it with dollar dog store, Svelte knows that that refers to a store. And if the data in the store changes, my component can re-render uh, anything that is using that data. And if I change the value of dollar dog store, other components can re-render as well. So it's a really easy way to set up state for the whole application. So some things to consider about using Svelte. Uh, popularity. Well, Svelte isn't as popular as uh, Angular and React and Vue at the moment. Uh, so that means that it's not as easy to find developers that already know it. However, I think it's so easy to learn Svelte that I don't see that as a very large barrier to entry. Of course, the other frameworks have been around for longer, and so there are more uh, open source libraries for those. They're growing for Svelte, uh, but they're not as many uh, yet as there are for the other frameworks. And then a the last thing I would mention is that when you're using React, you might be used to the idea that you can split up a component into a bunch of functions that each uh, return some JSX that are responsible for rendering a part of the component. And you can't do anything like that in Svelte. So that kind of encourages you to split up your components into multiple .svelte files, which has its own pros and cons. There are a lot of related tools to uh, Svelte, and so I have a list of some of those here, including a VS Code extension. I mentioned Svelte Kit, which is in beta right now, uh, should be out of beta fairly soon. There's libraries for writing tests with Svelte. Uh, Storybook is an excellent tool for testing out your components in kind of an isolated manner. And then Svelte Native can be used to write mobile apps with Svelte. Uh, it's not a ground up new thing. It's built on top of native script, which is a very mature framework for building mobile apps. And you can use that with many frameworks, felt being just one of those. There's a lot of topics I didn't have time to cover that are covered in detail in my book. So I encourage you to grab the slides and check out this list and maybe dig into those topics in a bit more detail.
So earlier I mentioned that talk by Rich Harris called Rethinking Reactivity. I highly recommend finding that talk. There's, of course, the Svelte homepage with all the API documentation and a really nice tutorial. It's a web page where you can read up on Svelte Kit and a few more resources there. So my conclusion is that Svelte is definitely a worthy alternative to the other frameworks. For me, a big emphasis is developer experience. That's the DX on the side here. And this is kind of my assessment of the state of things. You could write a web application just using the native DOM and not using a framework. But if you use a framework, I think the developer experience is better. And so Angular certainly improves on that. But I think React and Vue are a big step up over Angular in terms of developer experience. And I think Svelte just takes that even further. The user experience is similar for all of these in my view, but you might say that Svelte has a slight edge because of how easy it is to add animations to an app. You might end up delivering a better user experience just because that was so easy to do. So I encourage you to check out my book, Svelte and Sapper in Action. And we've got a few minutes left for questions if you have any.